This week, we speak with Francois Lassell from Ping Identity. In the news segment, we find a lower case for HTTP2, review a breach case for the cloud, make a case for fuzzing, and more. Stay tuned for Application Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. Make sure your team is prepared to fight off the latest cybersecurity threat. IT Pro TV is the resource to keep you and your IT team skills up to date. You can stream IT Pro TV courses live and on demand, so there's no need to send staff to off-site training. Team subscriptions include Pro Portal, so managers have full control over your team's training schedule. Go to itpro.tv slash ASW and use the code ASW30 to try it free for seven days and receive 30% off your monthly membership. Signal Sciences secures the most important web applications, APIs, and microservices of the world's leading companies, protecting over 7,500 applications and 150 billion production requests per week. Signal Sciences NextGen WAF and RASP help companies increase security and maintain site reliability without sacrificing velocity, all at the lowest total cost of ownership. Signal Sciences patented technology protects any application against any attack with integrations into any DevOps tool chain. Signal Sciences, demand more from your WAF. Learn more at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Welcome to Application Security Weekly. This is episode 80, recorded October 14th, 2019. I'm your host, Mike Shima. I'm here with Matt Alderman. Hey, Matt. Good morning. Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Looks like uh, you're back with the Broncos, but also even an early Halloween. Are you preparing for uh, hacker stock footage? I think you've got a hoodie on, right? today yeah i got my hoodie on i gotta i'll, I'll try to get it up uh, <laughs> over top of my headset and we've also got john kinsella john it's great to see you here no hoodie but uh, i can't believe it's monday again already monday again already we do have exciting news about the security weekly webcast program we are now partnered with ic squared as an official cpe provider if you attend any of our webcasts you will receive one cpe credit per webcast Register for one of our upcoming webcasts with Ajit Sanchetti of Preempt, Bryce Schroeder and Barbara Kay of ServiceNow, or Steve Lobenstein of Core Security, or all of them, by going to securityweekly.com, click the webcast dropdown, and select Registration. If you have missed any of our previously recorded webcasts, you can find our on-demand library by selecting On Demand from the webcast dropdown. Francois Lassell is a member of the Ping Identity Office of the CTO. He provides product and strategic direction to customers and partners with a focus on API infrastructure security and API cybersecurity. Prior to joining Ping, Francois was the first developer and chief architect at startup Layer 7 Technologies until his acquisition by CA Technologies. Francois was part of a team that developed a best-of-breed API security gateway technology which disrupted its category. Francois helped define the application of emerging security patterns such as OAuth in the context of API management and led field practice of architects helping customers with their digital modernization projects. Hello, Francois. Thank you for joining us today. Hello, Application Security Weekly. Great to be here. Well, it's great to have you because um, you, you know, we're Application Security Weekly and you've got some application programming interface security um, credentials behind you, both in the sense of the work you have done, as well as even a lot of the patterns that you've introduced around making API security better. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to dive in first just by saying, you know, we OWASP recently has made a distinction with an API security top 10, um, distinguishing from the more general OWASP top 10. So maybe we talk a little bit about, to you, what, why, what makes API security different? And why are we talking about API security specifically rather than just web security? Yeah. Yeah, API security. I mean, uh, we're talking about application security and, and, and uh, APIs very, very often do power applications. And API security is really hot right now, right? We've got um, uh, a few compounding pressures, I would say, that makes it so that API security is really hot. We've got, uh, you know, a need for more openness 
Uh, you see it, uh, organizations are trying to be more competitive to, to provide a, a service that can interrupt with uh, other things on behalf of users. So that, that's the need for more openness, which requires APIs. You even got regulations. If you think about um, open banking and TSD2 that's going on in Europe, that's, that's basically forcing uh, banks to open up their services. And, and you achieve that through um, APIs. So the need for more openness but also the need for more privacy. Uh, again, privacy is, is driven by uh, a market need, but it's also driven by regulation. If you think of GDPR, that's forcing organizations to, to, to secure private information. So you've got on one hand, the need for more openness, the need for more privacy, so more APIs and more security means more API security. So API security is very hot and it seems that a lot of people are not getting it right. API security is not easy. Um, so yeah, I think that that this is this is all pointing to API security being being very hot. If, if you uh, you mentioned the OAuth top ten specific to API security, I think that that is also uh, an indicator that there's there's a strong appetite for it. Um, and I think it's it's really important to understand that you know hackers will call your API outside of your app. Right, so you need to look at security from an API perspective because the hacker is going to skip the application, and if you do all your security testing from within your app, you're missing things, some untested for scenario. You're you're like kind of like an unknown zone, and you have a number of blind spots there. Francois, <laughs> you you describe two market needs uh, for API security, but I think the other thing that's happening from a technology perspective is. The way we're building applications means there's a whole heck of a lot more APIs under the covers than there ever have been. We're, we're not talking about an API or a set of APIs to a single monolithic application. We're talking about API communications across microservice-based architectures, which means we also have a lot more APIs to secure. I completely agree with that. Um, you know, a lot of security historically has been perimeter security, if you think about it, right? And, and API security for the last 15 years has, has, has been mainly focused on that. So mainly you've got a public facing API that your public clients are consuming, but you're right, internally, once you enter that, that perimeter, there's potentially a lot of interactions that are happening in order to serve these, these external API calls. And, and a lot of this activity is, is API. And if you think about zero trust, zero trust teaches us that we need to secure those APIs as well. We can't, we can't just assume we're in a trusted zone there. You know, like if you, if you think of zero trust applied to API security, what it tells us is that treat every API as if, as if it was a public API and, and stop thinking of your APIs in your trusted zone as, um, you know, not warranting the same level of security that you need for your outside API. That also, I think, speaks to the idea when we have so many APIs, how do you keep track of them? Because aren't, aren't we now introducing the problem when you know, we're supposed to have good asset management, good application management, but there's all these API endpoints and you're, you're right to call out that zero trust model, you know, these services talking to each other, but how do we even keep track of all the service, you know, all the endpoints that are out there, and maybe not all those endpoints should stay out there. You know, we've got maybe old versions, or even an idea of maybe some of them might be rogue um, endpoints. So, what does that look like, or how much of, you know, it, if we're talking about this is a really hot topic, what? And you mentioned a little bit blind spots that people have. What are? Let, let's expand a little bit about on that about blind spots you see, and maybe just starting with how do you just manage where all your APIs are. Yeah, that, that is definitely one of, uh, it, it's a very, very common concern. We hear that when we talk to our customers, but just a few weeks ago, Gartner um, recently re uh, uh, released a new report that looks specifically at API security. One of the top uh, recommendations is that organizations need to discover their APIs before attackers discover them. Um, and I think that what Gartner is thinking about when they're saying stuff like that is, is exactly what you were suggesting, right? There's, there's, there's this thing called rogue APIs. Uh, rogue APIs is, is, is the API that's not um, well known, right? 
uh, sometimes I talk to uh, a customer that's not very API aware, and I will ask them about their APIs. You know, what are you doing to secure their APIs? And they'll say, we don't have APIs. Uh, we're not there yet. And, and then you show them this, this, this application, right? Oh, you have this application, right? Like, I can go and, 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 and consume your service through this application. How does that work? And they're not sure. And they find out, well, yeah, it's an API, but it's, but it's a private API. You know, we're not making this public. So that, that's what I call an implementation detail, right? You've got two scrum teams that know about this API. Nobody else knows about this API, but the hacker is going to easily reverse engineer it. And, and that's when you're really in the danger zone. If you've not acknowledged this API, you're not securing it. So, so people are saying, I'm not confident that I know about all my APIs that are out there. You've got rogue APIs. You've got um, the old forgotten version, right? We've been doing APIs now for a couple decades almost. And, you know, those APIs evolve. And you've got new versions coming out. And, and, and maybe you, um, you need to keep an old version going for a little bit for a client that's not quite ready for a migration. Uh, and then you forget about it, right? Uh, but they're still out there. So you've got old versions, you've got the rogue API. So, so API uh, inventory, if you want, is, is a problem. And API management is giving you a catalog of API, but that's not, that's not necessarily effective APIs. And this is what we're looking at at, at Thing Ident. We, we're, we're listing APIs from looking at your API traffic to create a list of APIs based on effective traffic. This is what we're actually seeing going uh, on the network. So that's, that's our strategy to complement uh, your API governance, if you like. So I think, Francois, that might be interesting to take a step back there for a second. Um, when I think of ping, I think of the ping probably from you know three to five years ago. It's an authentication provider, um, sounding a little bit like over the years the story has changed. Which you know not not a bad thing. We we desperately need API security, but maybe it might help to take a few seconds to talk to our listeners about sort of how um, ping has progressed over the last few years. Absolutely. So I was doing API security, you know, back in in the, the mid two thousands, and, and I do remember ping already in those days because of their um, their participation in federation standards. Uh, for example, mm -hmm. OAuth, which you know, yep. became popular in 2010. OAuth became the de facto way that you issue a token and then you, you validate a proof of authentication in an API flow. Uh, so ping identity was very much, I would say, in those early days of API security, Ping Identity was, was already on my radar. I already thought in those days about, about Ping Identity in terms of API security because of that, that, that participation in the token aspect of API security. But recently, you are correct, Ping Identity has been focusing on API security outside of authentication uh, with things, for example, like Ping Data Governance. Ping Data Governance is really... Uh, uh, focus on API security and it addresses an API security problem that uh, where where you've got authorization decisions that need to be made based on very dynamic uh, pieces of information like user consent. So so Pink Data Governance allows you to manage this user consent and apply it at runtime. It literally looks at your API responses and it will look in, at the payload, the data inside the structured data inside your API traffic in order to make sure that you're not leaking out something that you shouldn't be leaking out. It's in order to make sure that uh, only the information that the users are, is consenting on allowing an application to see is coming through. So that's Thing Data Governance. Another aspect, another product that Thing Identity uh, is, is uh, focusing on these days is a product called Thing Intelligence for APIs. And Thing Intelligence for APIs is about monitoring your API traffic, uh, uh, feeding uh, API traffic metadata into an AI engine, which is building machine learning models for your APIs, and then leveraging that for detecting anomalies at runtime. So really going beyond this foundational API security and catching attacks that you can't block with those traditional tools in order to uh, really augment your API security. So th those two tools in particular um, are, are new with uh, Ping Identity, and, and they both have a very direct focus on API security. 
So what's interesting about the strategy, just quickly, John, is, you know, I've, I've been saying for years, I scream it at the rooftops whenever I can. It's about app user data, app user data. Uh, what's interesting, though, is most people who have gone after API security have kind of come more at it from the application side of the house. But API security also has a big part in identity, machine identity, API identity, and that authentication component, I think it's really interesting to see Ping move from a traditional authentication play into API security from, from that perspective. Because if we think about where the perimeter is moving, it's not only the identity, it's the identity's interaction with these applications and or these APIs. And it's a really interesting story when you think about bringing those components together from a n not traditional sense. Yeah, absolutely. And, and if you think of what we're doing with uh, uh, Ping Intelligence for APIs, you know, because we have Ping Intelligence for APIs processing this API traffic metadata, and because Ping Identity has obviously a lot of information about the identity, we have the ability to enrich this metadata with all this identity information. Uh, you know, if, if you're purely looking at your API traffic, the identity associated with these transactions is opaque to you. Uh, but but by dereferencing this additional information and by enriching the API metadata with it, we can provide additional value in terms of the visibility that we're giving you from a security perspective. It's not just about building uh, machine learning models for what your different API clients normally do, but what do your actual users do and how does that look in your API traffic? That's another way that we can um, do things like detect uh, uh, deviations from models and predict attacks in real time. So maybe I was curious a little, a little more detail about um, what are you doing there or how? So based off what you've said so far, I'm thinking this could either be a, an IPS or some sort of sniffer, or it could be a library which is compiled into code, or how are you actually getting this feed for what APIs are out there when you mentioned uh, being able to uh, track that down? Yeah, and, and if you think about what we said earlier, right, people are not confident that they know about all the APIs that they have. So where are you mm -hmm. getting this data from is obviously very important. Uh, so Ping Intelligence for APIs, first and foremost, we have formal integrations with uh, all of the relevant uh, API gateway vendors. And, and we mm -hmm. do that because um, those, ha those, those types of products are present in a lot of API stacks. So we're, we're talking about the Mule soft gateways, we're talking about Apogee, we're talking about, you know, Axway, WSO2, uh, uh, I'm going to hate myself for dropping, you know, some really good partners, uh, you know, Broadcom and, and IBM and, and all of those guys, right? Um, Tibco. So that's, that's our, 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 I would say, our more de facto or more popular integration point where we'll run as a sideband build gateway. So we don't want to mess up with how your API traffic is flowing. Uh, so we'll, we'll be on the side of that gateway and, and we have a little agent running on that gateway, which is going to extract from the API transaction that it processes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. The, it will extract the metadata that's needed to feed it to the data lake. So traditional API gateways, load balancers and, and, and emerging technologies like Nginx is another way where we will also be able to run sideband. Um, if you have other APIs on the cloud, uh, you know, we'll run in an Amazon CloudFront, for example, which is very often the entry point for these APIs on your cloud. Um, but the way that we uh, pull this information and, and, and populate in our data lake itself uh, has an API associated with it to make it easy for people to attach this wherever they want. Um, so, for example, in, 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 in my sandbox right now, uh, to keep things lightweight, uh, I have a, a microservice that, that to which I've, I've attached a service filter, so a Spring Boot microservice filter, which is going to feed that metadata directly without having to go to a gateway or something like that. So this gives you a lot of, of options, right? From the, the, the very, um, you know, uh, upstream to the very downstream, like from, from the, the low balancer, the cloud front, all the way to the microservice, and anything in between. And you can also run it in line. It doesn't have to be sideband. We can also ourselves act as a reverse proxy. So by, by doing this, you maximize your opportunities to catch this API traffic metadata. And one last thing about this 
is, is um, you know, when we talked about the blind spot, uh, one thing that, that I forgot to mention is that right now people have been implementing API stacks for a while and a lot of organizations have a heterogeneous environment, right? They'll have some Apigee here and some IBM there and they will have their own inconsistent uh, security, um, uh, security rules, their inconsistent visibility. So we're just pulling from all these different sources into a single data lake and we'll aggregate this information and give you visibility and security for all of it. Inconsistencies, I find that very hard to believe. <laughs> Inconsistencies, <laughs> that's right, yeah. Yeah, it is inconsistent, right? And there are a number of reasons why these API silos um, are starting to happen, and and it is a real problem. Right, people are are in situations where you know they're getting a set of metrics, a, a set of of uh, uh, key performance indicators from one stack that is hard to compare with what the other stack is looking at, um, and it, it is a problem for API governance in this uh, in these API silos. So I think what the one of the things that brings us to is that this gives us the ability to um, build detections, both on just that sort of that configuration drift or call it like that, those impedance mismatches between different um, components. But we talk about, we, you know, we've read over um, uh, from sources like Verizon DBIR, um, I think FireEye or Mandiant publishes statistics on breaches aren't detected over, until after, you know, a period of months or until somebody goes and checks Pastebin and finds some unfortunate amount of their data uh, uh, posted up there. But this type of um, uh, this type of monitoring leads to that detection, which can be done, idea hopefully, uh, you know, a matter of minutes rather than months, right? Because we're not just looking at the the data transfers, but that aspect of that identity is is giving that additional information of should this service actually be doing this, or even potentially, maybe I'm going too far along here, this service is overprivileged, or this service could have access to other types of data um, if the API were misused. And that misuse could come from that idea of that rogue API where it was a one-off or a customer-specific API that needed to bypass a rate limiting function or something like that. So is that one way to think about using these types of detections? Or, what, or how can we think about that? Yeah, no, I think it is very much, um, you know, and, and a lot of those breaches that we're talking about that, that we see happening, you're right. I mean, detection has <clears throat> taken months to happen. And to me, that's just another way of saying, you know, our security tools did not actually detect those breaches. If it takes months and years, it, you know, what, ha what ends up happening is that maybe a hacker is demanding a ransom and then you look into it and say, oh yeah, look at that, we've been hacked the last few months, right? Or, or maybe a user is complaining that uh, their identity was stolen uh, and they think that that information come through, came through your service and, and you look into it. And again, that's how you find out that um, your, your API was breached. So it takes months and years for these things to happen. You apply machine learning uh, and yes, you, you reduce that to minutes per second. And you know, if you think of, of uh, the problem with API security, um, you know, the, what the hacker has on you in these situations is that, like I was saying earlier, the hacker calls your API outside of your app and then they can poke around and they can find vulnerabilities and they do things that would not be possible if you were, if you were still going through the client's application. But because the hacker is skipping that, that, that opens a number of security problems. But the same property of a hacker acting outside of the app is exactly what stands out, what deviates from those models, those, those machine learning models that we build around your API security. So that's the great news. You know, that really, it, that, that is a very, very good application of machine learning. By looking for these deviations, you are uh, not only detecting those things, but you can block them as well. And, and that's uh, you know the way that we integrate, for example, with the gateways allows us to not just detect, but tell the gateway, hey, you should you should stop that. You know, we. we we predict that this is used outside of legit app and, and whatever this token or this cookie uh, or, or this API key should be blocked. So this, this is how it works. 
So another way of finding anomalies is actually, um, in theory, dropping like a, a honeypot API or an API with a, a, a honey token in it that um, if it gets hit, obvious, is a pretty obvious and glaring um, anomaly because there's no code ostensibly that should have been written and no user should have been going after that. So in right. practice, however, how much, you know, how, how well would that fit in with this type of um, methodology and, you know, would going down that route, you know, should you consider trying to do some, some honeypot um, APIs? Yeah, we, we talk about decoys. So API decoys is another thing that Ping Intelligence for APIs does. So, you know, we've talked about things that, that take months and years to be detected. So you apply machine learning, you shrink <clears> that down to minutes and seconds. And, and what decoys do is uh, they create effectively traps for hackers to uh, to, to to trip to trip the hacker, right? So so um, the, these decoys, these API decoys, are not known by your application. They, they're not real APIs. Um, and these decoys, whenever they're touched, the engine will know that whoever touched this wasn't a legit application. And, and for, for the attacker, when you're hitting one of those decoys, you're not aware of it because the way that, that we do it, we, we just return um, a response that looks like a, a, an okay response, right? You get a 200 okay and, 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 and things like that. Uh, but in the background, we're flagging the hacker. So if, if you think, you know, that if you think of the, the hacking behavior where they're starting by poke around, until they find a vulnerability and then they launch an attack. So now by flagging them with those decoys, we're, we're effectively flagging them and stopping the attack before the attack even started. So you went from years and months to minutes and seconds to you know, a technique that allows you to flag and stop the attack before it even started. And that, that's the best, best case scenario. So you can stop something like that because you've eliminated the damage caused by that completely. That's great, uh, Francois. I have one quick question um, before we finish up. Who's the buyer, right? You you transcend this very interesting uh, set of personas, right? Is this security's responsibility or is it development's responsibility? Because nah. development's writing the APIs, but the security team has to figure out. So who's buying these solutions based on your current customers yeah that's that is a very good question because you know a lot of the api management infrastructure is not um it's not typically the security buyer right it's typically the enterprise architect typically the middleware the integration team and stuff like that but in this case it will very often be the security team um and that also enables us to provide visibility to a security team, which often uh, complains that they don't have, right? Um, you know, they, they could go to the architecture team and, and ask for all the lists of APIs and what they're doing, stuff like that, but they don't necessarily have control over that. So by, by putting these agents in um, the API traffic uh, 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 collection points, if you like, we allow the security team to get back a visibility that from an organizational perspective, they are complaining that they don't have enough of right now. And by attaching it to these different stacks, that's even better, right? Because you might have three different departments that each have their API stack. Uh, and then like we were saying earlier, uh, the data that you get from there, from each might be inconsistent. Uh, so now the security team has the ability to get a consistent uh, picture of the, the effective APIs, uh, who's calling them, how much uh, it, it gives you visibility on anomalies across these different stacks. Uh, so it is very much the security uh, buyer as uh, as opposed to what the typical buyer is for the API management uh, tooling. That's good because all the security teams need better visibility into this data. So hopefully That's they're right. calling you up to say, hey, uh, help me here because I'm not quite sure what the app team is actually doing over there while they're developing these new apps. You got it. That's right. Speaking of developing the, these new apps, um, from a deployment perspective, or because you're mentioning, you know, that this does tie into a lot of the the gateways already. So I think that that sounds like a, a pretty low friction, pretty easy um, 
way to get you know to get visibility into the APIs. But we we've also talked a lot about you know what does it mean to be cloud native or using cloud you know the the, the native services provided or in, in cloud service providers. So <clears throat> when applications are going to the cloud does it actually make this t this whole aspect of visibility into the api easier or even just enumerating api endpoints easier or there's still mistakes that people would be making if they're building these and they're you know in their own data centers and in, in an older more traditional model yeah i mean going to the cloud um and and getting the information out of those apis that are hosted on the cloud uh can can be difficult, right? So if if you are the API publisher and you're just using a cloud provider as um, you know an alternative to hosting uh, those APIs uh, yourself, that that's not a, that big of a stretch, right? Like I said earlier, you can go through the cloud front, you can go uh, downstream into the API endpoints and feed that information through these little agents. That 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 works fine. Uh, <laughs> But if you're if you're thinking of API CC from the perspective of you know somebody else's API, you know like mm -hmm. I, I I have people in my organization that are using applications that are calling APIs that are completely out of my control, then it becomes harder uh, because you never have the ability to see 100% of the API traffic from somebody else's API's perspective, um, and so that can become a bit of a blind spot, and that's where you know, the client-side agent uh, can help you get some of that visibility, uh, but you're not going to see the full picture. Um, and, you know, I think that there's a, something needs to happen there, in my opinion. Um, cloud providers need to give you the ability uh, to request and get information about their APIs that are relating to your usage of their service, just so that you can attach a lot of, um, you know, not just your collection of the insights that you need, but also look for anomalies like we're doing for your own APIs, right? The same way that cloud providers today allow you to hook up to their service in order to inject yourself into the authentication of your workforce, right? Like single sign-on, like you would do with Salesforce. You need something similar for the API traffic. I think that that's the next one here. I, I hope that this uh, starts to happen. No, that's really interesting. And two two really good points there is that, you know, it's not just the API you're developing that you have to be concerned of, but the data going in and out of it and interacting with the other other APIs and other services that are creating this mesh uh, for, you know, B2B, even B2C type of um, really complex applications. And then the last part was very really interesting about that the cloud is perhaps abstracted too much of the capabilities of their API and too much infrastructure and that that's losing or not making it as easy to gain visibility or I guess your your bigger point there was uh, being able to do analysis on top of that visibility in order to do that uh, anomaly detection or other type of security event detection. That's right. Oh, well, I that's think right. that, that, go ahead. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I think that that is the case. And when you're using a service provider, right, you, you are, you know, uh, purchasing a service for something that you otherwise would have to build yourself. Um, but that doesn't mean that you don't want the ability to uh, hook up into that service in order to uh, get the analysis that you want out of it. No, and I think that uh, for as much as for as much as we in working in security know about inconsistencies between different uh, configurations and configuration drifts, Francois, you've given a pretty consistent and strong message about API security. So I want to thank you for uh, coming and chatting with us. Thank you very much. That was fun. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank Matt and John and thank everyone for listening. We're going to take a quick break and we're going to turn with news of the week. <laughs> 